یک اجلاس پارلمانی در مقر پارلمان نروژ در اسلو که با حضور رئیس جمهور برگزیده مقاومت خانم مریم رجوی نایب رئیس پارلمان نروژ خانم ماریت نیباک و شماری از نمایندگان پارلمان از احزاب مختلف این کشور برگزار شد بیانیه حمایت اکثریت پارلمان از مجاهدان اشرف اعلام شد و مورتون هوگلوند به نمایندگی از سوی اکثریت مجلس نروژ سند امضا شده از سوی 91 نماینده پارلمان را به خانم رجوی اهدا کرد در این اجلاس پارلمانی علاوه بر نمایندگان پارلمان نروژ لورد دالاکیا عضو مجلس اعیان انگلستان و معاون رهبر حزب لیبرال به نمایندگی از سوی کمیته ایران آزاد در مجلس این انگلستان آقای یان کریستیان لوند نماینده پارلمان دانمارک دکتر خوان گارسه وکیل مجاهدان اشرف در دادگاه اسپانیا و شمار دیگری از شخصیت های سیاسی، حقوقی و مدافعان حقوق بشر در کشورهای اسکاندیناوی شرکت داشتند نایب رئیس پارلمان نروژ که اجلاس پارلمانی را افتتاح کرد تیه سخنانی ضمن خیر مقدم مجدد به خانم رجوی حضور نمایندگان پارلمان نروژ از احزاب و گرایش های مختلف سیاسی در این اجلاس پارلمانی را خاطر نشان و تاکید کرد ما در پارلمان نروژ به شدت در قبال نقض حقوق بشر در ایران نقض حقوق اقلیت ها سرکوب تظاهرات و به خصوص در مورد اعمال فشارهای ضد انسانی رژیم ایران علیه اعضای اپوزیسیون در شهر اشرف در عراق نگرانیم و امروز میخواهیم وضعیت را در سخنرانی خانم رجوی رئیس جمهور منتخب مقاومت ایران بشنویم رئیس جمهور برگزیده مقاومت در سخنرانی خود ضمن سپاسگزاری و قدردانی از حمایت اکثریت نمایندگان مردم نروژ از مقاومت ایران و مجاهدان اشرف تاکید کرد بیانیه اکثریت نمایندگان نروژ که بر حفاظت و ممنوعیت جابجایی اجباری ساکنان اشرف تاکید می‌کند بیانگر پایبندی شما به ارزش‌های انسانی است این بیانیه است برای حقوق بشر برای صلح و برای امنیت جهانی شما دوستان روزهای سختی و مرارت مردم ایران هستید و هیچگاه در خاطره مردم ایران فراموش نخواهید شد در خاتمه اجلاس پارلمانی که مشروع آن همکنون پخش می شود رئیس جمهور برگزیده مقاومت با تشکر مجدد از نمایندگان مجلس نروژ هدیه سمبولیک شهر اشرف به پارلمان نروژ را از سوی مجاهدان اشرف به آقای مورتون هوگلوند اهدا کرد بیانیه اکثریت نمایندگان پارلمان نروژ ما بسیار نگران وضعیت 3400 عضو اپوزیسیون ایرانی مستقر در کمپ اشرف در عراق هستیم رژیم ایران تلاش می کند از طریق دولت عراق آنان را نابود سازد حمله مرگبار نیروهای عراقی به کمپ اشرف در 28 و 29 ژوئیه یازده کشته و پانصد زخمی و سی و شش گروگان از اعضای سازمان مجاهدین خلق ایران اپوزیسیون رژیم ایران به جای گذاشت گروگان های بیگناه تنها بعد از یک کارزار گسترده جهانی و بعد از هفتاد و دو روز اعتصاب غذا در حالی که در آستانه مرگ قرار داشتند آزاد شدند اف بین الملل، فدراسیون جهانی حقوق بشر، سازمان جهانی علیه شکنجه و دیدبان حقوق بشر و اسخف اعظم کانتربری تیه بیانیه های متعدد ضمن محکوم کردن این حمله نگرانی خود را در مورد وضعیت ساکنان اشرف ابراز داشتند. 
قطنامه 24 آوریل 2009 پارلمان اروپا تصریح می کند ساکنان اشرف افراد حفاظت شده در چارچوب کنونسیون چهار ژنو هستند و دولت عراق باید به حقوق آنها احترام بگذارد و از اخراج آنها یا جابجایی اجباری آنها در داخل عراق خودداری کند و به محاصری آنان پایان دهد امروز یک نگرانی عمومی وجود دارد که نیروهای راغی بار دیگر به درخواست رژیم ایران و برای خوش آمد این رژیم به کشتار ساکنان اشرف مبادرت کنند نیروهای مهاجم همچنان در اشرف و اطراف آن حضور دارند ما ضمن اعلام همبستگی با ساکنان اشرف و خانواده های آنها حمایت خود را از خواست های آنها اعلام و از دولت نروژ می خواهیم در هماهنگی با سازمان ملل متحد اتحادیه اروپا و دولت آمریکا به طور خاص برای تحقق فوری موارد زیر تلاش کند تضمین حفاظت ساکنان اشرف و عدم تکرار حمله و خشونت و جابجایی اجباری توسط نیروهای آمریکایی تأکید سازمان ملل متحد بر ممنوعیت جابجایی اجباری ساکنان اشرف در داخل عراق به عنوان افراد حفاظت شده التزام دولت عراق به قطنامه 24 آوریل 2009 پارلمان اروپا و تصریح بر حق ساکنان اشرف در برخورداری از حقوق و حفاظتهای بنیادین کنونسیون چهارم ژنو امضا کنندگان بیانیه همچنین از دولت عراق میخواهند به مواد فوق که منطبق با موازین حقوق بین الملل و حقوق انسان دوستانه و حقوق بشر بین المللی است احترام بگذارد و آنها را به اجرا درآورد اجرای این مواد اعتبار و حیثیت عراق به عنوان یک دولت مستقل و دموکراتیک را که متاسفانه زیر علامت سؤال رفته احیا می کند و ارتقا می دهد Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, um, it is uh, an honor for me to welcome you to this meeting. Uh, this is a meeting about Iran, uh, and it is also a meeting about the situation in the refugee camp in Ashraf in, in Iraq. Um, and first and foremost, it is a meeting with Mrs. Mariam Rajavi. Welcome to us. Um, we, some of us, had the honor and the pleasure of meeting her yesterday, and we were talking to her about the current situation in Iran and also about Ashraf. Uh, and may I say, may I see, uh, may I say, um, to begin with, that um, we are all worried. We are worried about the, the, the situation in Iran, about the development. We are worried about uh, the constant violation of human rights, and we are worried 
uh, about the role of the mullahs, the guardian council, the revolutionary guard. We see the executions of minors, uh, and we don't like what we see. We are also worried about the stability of this regime uh, over many years. Uh, but we were also able to see this summer that people were running out into the street in Tehran protesting against uh, the elections. And maybe there is hope. I've been working with Iran for, I think it's 20 years now, and uh, uh, for the first time I feel that people really stood up. But it is difficult in Iran because of the double uh, system of, of, of government, so to speak, uh, with the Guardian um, Council uh, being, and the mullahs being the real uh, people in power. Then, of course, we are genuinely worried about the situation in Ashraf. And uh, can I add that when the Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, that was the committee until this autumn, uh, had a visit from uh, the Secretary General of the UN in June, we took the, uh, up the situation of uh, uh, what was going on in Ashraf. You will hear more about this. Uh, my role here um, is to welcome you all, and first of all to, to welcome Mrs. Marian Rajavi once again. Uh, you've been in Norway twice before. Mm -hmm. I remember very well the first time. I was in 1995. And uh, what I remember most was that Mariam Rajavi wanted to attend um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the wanted to go to church in, in the mm -hmm. cathedral of Oslo. And I was one of those who accompanied her. That was something that people really um, was genuinely um, uh, impressed by. It, 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 it takes some courage for a Muslim to say that I want to go to you, to your religion, and I want to pay respect to your religion. Um, you were also in, in Oslo about two or three years ago, and we remember that too had a meeting with, with the Committee on Foreign Affairs. So, welcome to us, and we'll be looking forward to listening to you. And here, we are, here are Norwegian parliamentarians, here are advisors, but there are also members of the House of Lords and, 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 and the, the House of Commons in Britain, uh, the Danish Parliament and the Spanish Parliament. Uh, representing support groups in their respective parliaments. Um, and uh, we will be looking forward to listening to you. And I'm sure that there are lots of people here uh, who want to, to ask questions. There are also people here from the, from the uh, trade unions and, and, and from the uh, international forum in, in the Oslo Labour Party. So please, the, the floor is yours. Botten is, go, uh, is going to, to chair this meeting, and that, that's what I should have said. So please, Botten. <laughs> Thank you, Marit. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to also wish everybody welcome, and I'm happy to say that uh, uh, Marim Rajavi and uh, the organization she shares has friends in all parties in the Norwegian Parliament. And um, we had a very successful meeting with the Foreign Affairs Committee yesterday. The main item of today's agenda is, of course, to, to listen to you and be able to have a dialogue with you. But I also want to, I'm happy to announce that we have now um, 91 members of the Norwegian Parliament has signed uh, their support for the people in Ashraf and the humanitarian situation which we are facing in Ashraf. And this shows the broad support for the people of Ashraf, for freedom in Iran. And I'm very happy to hand over this uh, book with the signatures.
Honorable Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished representatives of the Norwegian people, it's an honor to be among you once again. I would like to first, on behalf of the Iranian people, express my deepest gratitude to you for your support of the Iranian resistance for democracy and freedom. I would like to thank you, especially on behalf of the Mujahideen of Camp Ashraf, for your efforts in support of their rights. The declaration of the majority of the Norwegian parliament, underlining protection and prohibition of the forcible displacement of Ashraf residents, indicates your dedication to human values. This is a declaration for human rights, for peace, for security in the world. You are friends of the Iranian people in hardship and you will never be forgotten. The last time that I was here, I spoke to you of my dream for a free and democratic Iran. I spoke to you uh, of my dream, an Iran in which there will be no sign of torture, executions, or stoning, where people will not be restricted in free assembly and free expression of their beliefs, where women will have full and equal rights, including participation in political leadership, where there will be no discrimination against followers of various religions and ethnic minorities, where the resources of, of a non-nuclear Iran would be used for a better life for the people and not obtaining nuclear weapons, an Iran that will encourage peace and friendship and not fundamentalism and violence. There are the principles of our platform and the image of the Iran that we struggle for a free and democratic Iran. Dear friends, Today, I'm here to say to you that we are not far from realizing such hopes. Millions of Iranians have come to the streets since last June and declared their demand for the clerical regime's downfall. The regime has not stopped at any crime in suppressing the people. Many of you may have seen on television the last moments in the life of Neda, the young woman who was shot by a revolutionary guard. She was one of the many who have given their lives for freedom in Iran. Thousands of people have been arrested, many tortured, raped, and sentenced to death in the last six months during the protests in Iran. But the regime has not been able to stop the uprising. One month after the start of the uprising in Iran, during last July, Iraqi forces attacked Iran's organized opposition in Camp Ashraf at the behest of the Mullah's regime. Ashraf, as the symbol of resistance, is home to 3,400 members of the People's Mujahideen Organization of Iran. The Norwegian people are proud of their resistance to Nazi occupation. The success of the Norwegian resistance could be seen in the determination of its fighters in the snowy forests, and the hope that they generated in the hearts of their people so they could continue their resistance to the occupiers. 
I believe you understand well the reason for which the mullahs want to destroy Ashraf and pressure the Iraqi government. The people of Ashraf are women and men who have dedicated their lives to the prosperity of the Iranian people. Indeed, as Masoud Rajavi, the leader of the Iranian resistance, has said, the attack on Ashraf at the behest of the Mullah's regime during the Iranian people's nationwide uprising clearly showed that Ashraf is the source of hope and inspiration for the Iranian people. Many of them were imprisoned and tortured by the Mullah's regime. Khamenei hoped to destroy Ashraf and spread despair among Iranian people. But the perseverance of Ashraf's residents and the extensive international solidarity with them defeated the regime's plots. The UN Secretary General, Mr. Ban Ki-moon, formally declared in his report to the Security Council last month that UNAMI, with support from the United Nations High Commissioner on Human Rights, has undertaken the monitoring responsibility in Ashraf. This is an important step forward, but the battle continues. The Mullah's regime tries to pressure the Iraqi government to destroy Camp Ashraf before the upcoming Iraqi elections in January. Ali Larijani, the speaker of the regime's parliament, repeated demands in a recent official trip to Iraq for the extradition and deportation of Ashraf residents. Camp Ashraf is currently under siege on 25 November. Residents of Ashraf were informed that the entry of medicine and doctors to the camp are banned. It is more than one month that no fuel has been allowed into the camp. And severe restrictions have been imposed for the entry of food. At the same time, the Iraqi government has given the residents of Ashraf a deadline of 15th of December to leave Ashraf. The forcible displacement of Ashraf residents is a gross violation of international humanitarian law and international human rights law. The displacement of Ashraf residents to an isolated region or one that is under the influence of the Mullah's regime is a prelude to, to their massacre. I call on you, the distinguished members of parliament, to raise your voices against any forcible displacement of Ashraf residents that has their massacre as its goal. Last week, a Spanish court declared its jurisdiction to investigate the crimes committed against Camp Ashraf. The investigation will be on violation of Geneva Conventions. This is a major development and recognition of the status of Ashraf residents by an independent judicial system. Dr. Garces, the leader lawyer in this case, who present here, will certainly explain more, but I think this decision is a formidable backing for effective international measures to protect the rights of Ashraf residents. Norway can play a historical role in this issue due to its international credibility. I appeal to you to request the Norwegian government to initiate a firm position by the United Nations against any forcible displacement or use of violence against the residents of Camp Ashraf. 
UN should oblige the Iraqi government to respect their recognized rights of Ashraf residents under international humanitarian law and international human rights law. This would be the necessary step for Iraq to join the community of democratic countries. Distinguished members of parliament, Khamenei has not been able to contain the uprising and regain his lost balance through the most domestic suppression and an attack on Ashraf. Therefore, he tries to accelerate his efforts to obtain nuclear weapons and to cover up his domestic weakness and instability. Negotiations and appeasement of the mullahs is a dangerous policy that shall result in a fundamentalist regime becoming armed with nuclear weapons. In response to IAEA demand to close down the COM facility, the Iranian regime said that it intends to build 10 new nuclear sites and more centrifuges. In the last anti-government demonstration, on the 4th of November, the Iranian people declared their uh, disapproval of this policy and called on President Obama to make clear whether he stands with the Iranian people and their aspirations or with the Mullah's regime. Indeed, the message of the Iranian nation to President Obama and Western governments is simple and clear. You have to make a choice. Choose between the Iranian people and the Khamenei and Ahmadinejad regime. Choose between human rights or commercial interests. Choose between defense of liberty and siding with the people or closing your eyes to the regime's crimes and pursuing a policy of appeasement. The Iranian people's message to Western governments is you cannot have it both ways. The time has come to choose. The time has come to listen to the voice of the Iranian people for change. A democratic change by the Iranian people and their resistance. Please allow me to once again call upon you, my distinguished friends and members of parliament, to actively support Ashraf. The Iranian people look to Norway and your support. There are many barriers, but I have no doubt that with your help, we will overcome them. We shall overcome and freedom will echo in Iran. I thank you all. Thank you so much. I would now like to ask uh, some, a few of our international friends who are here to just make some short comments. Lord Dolakia from the UK House of Lords. He is the deputy leader of the Liberal Party and he's speaking on behalf of the British Parliamentary Committee for Iran. You have the floor, sir. Distinguished chairman, parliamentarians, members of the trade unions, international friends, and my dear friend, Madame Rajavi, can I first of all thank you for giving me this opportunity to address you. I come here as a British parliamentarian, a member of the House of Lords, and I come here also to demonstrate that my parliament, within which over 300 members in the House of Commons have given support to the cause of Iranian movement, 
and in the House of Lords equally the same number of people who have been part of support for the cause of the freedom of Iran as advocated by Mrs. Rajavi. It hasn't been an easy exercise, but let me say why I'm here. You know, everywhere in the world that I travel, Norway and the Scandinavian country stand as a beacon of democracy and rights and liberties of people throughout the world. Some of us can't claim the same thing because we were part of an imperial heritage. But you can because you have that respect throughout the world. And I'm here again to support you. And I'm delighted that 91 or more than 90 people have signed that particular resolution that shows your determination in terms of, of tackling the injustice that exists in Iran today. But there is another reason I'm here. You were gracious enough as your Nobel Prize Committee to award an honor for peace to President Obama, who is going to come here in the next couple of days, I hear, and you will honor him for that. I just want you to have a quiet chat with him that with that peace, it also, he also carries the responsibility to make sure that there is justice and peace and liberty in Iran. And as a sign of that one, United Nations must, uh, United States must come out of the cocoon within which it finds itself and support to start off with the citizens of Ashraf. But there is another reason why we are here. Because Iran insulted the Nobel Committee by returning one of the Nobel Prize to one of its citizens. That shows you how oppressive this regime has been. And it is right and proper. And I always say it, it is not people who are fighting in Ashraf to preserve their rights and dignity to stay there, which is their right under the United Nations Convention. They will do that. But when good people do not speak, then we are as responsible as the others in trying to condone what is going on. And I very much hope that we'll be able to put right. And the reason I say this, as British parliamentarians, we are very proud. We took the government on when they proscribed PMOI as a terrorist organization. And we say no. We took up them through various courts in the United Kingdom. And finally, it was resolved at the highest level that this was not a terrorist organization. And indeed, we are very proud in the memory of Lord Slynn and other famous constitutional lawyers who played their part in trying to light this beacon and say to the world, respect for what this particular movement is doing. But the second reason I think is also very important. Mrs. Rajavi mentioned about the position that Iran plays in world politics. Do you know it is in the interest of Iran to focus attention on Ashraf in what is going on because it can then hide behind that particular picture for some of the vile policy it is pursuing in relation to nuclear arms, in relation to the shipment of arms to parts of African continent, in parts of Eritrea, in Somalia, where it has created so much uneasiness, strife, and it is against the interest of many of the peace-loving nations in the way Iran is behaving, apart from its nuclear capacity that Mrs. Rajavi has mentioned. So what do we do? And I've got a very limited time. And I think it is right and we identify this very clearly. I have always believed that citizens of Ashraf must be protected. The violence that was perpetrated, which resulted in a number of deaths, but more important than that, the injuries that was caused. And I can tell you, if any one of you were to watch that particular video, you will have tears in your eyes because this should not happen to any citizen who is a peace-loving person living in that country. And I can tell you now, when the Americans and Britons and everybody have left Iraq, I have no doubt at all that Iran's eyes is also 
on Iraq and much of the wealth, etc., that it could sequester from that particular country. We need to make sure that this doesn't happen. So how do we go about it? In the few minutes of my time, let me first of all say that we must speak up at every level. The United Nations UNAMI not simply should monitor. Monitoring is the end product of what has happened. They'll say, yes, this is what happened, but I don't even want that to happen. And for that not to happen, United Nations has a right, UNAMI has a right to ensure that it offers that particular protection on behalf of the civilized world to the citizens of Ashraf. But we have, must have another strategy. I said to you, we can't keep quiet about it. We can't just sit down and say, yes, we are aware, pass a resolution saying this is wrong. I have advocated to my own government, I've said, that I'm very keen as part of the British delegation, part of the delegation from the European Union, and I hope countries like Norway will associate, that we go to Ashraf and warn the governments of Iran and, uh, and Iraq that we are watching you. We are here to ensure that there is justice and freedom of the people who are living in that camp. And if that were not to happen, then let me tell you, we should warn them now that we will hound those who perpetrate such crime against innocent citizens by making sure that International Criminal Court actually will, will deal with this particular issue as we have been dealing with this issue in Serbia, as we have been dealing with these particular issues in relation to Rwanda, as we are dealing with this particular issue in relation to Sierra Leone and other parts of the world. They must know that they will be accountable for what happens to people in Ashraf. But there is another strategy as well. And that strategy effectively means that if we want the peace, if we want the stability of the nations around us, then I think it is right and proper that all of us are part of a movement within which we make sure that that resolution of the rights to remain stays there. But we need to press United Nations as well, not simply of their particular role in Iraq and Ashraf, but very much in the United Nations of what we can do. I started, Mr. Chairman, as saying that nowhere is the conscience of the world. But I want all of, all, all of us to ensure, ensure that there are some issues on which civilized world will never compromise. And the rights and the liberties of people of Ashraf is one that such issue on which we will stand together and fight that. Thank you very much indeed. Then I have the honor to give the floor to a prominent international lawyer, um, Dr. Juan Gar Garcia. And uh, we will very much like to hear from him about the legal perspectives and whatever he has to convey. Your, the floor is yours. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Xavi, uh, distinguished parliamentarians, ladies and gentlemen. I come from the south of Europe, from Spain, and let me tell you uh, that it is a honor to me to take the floor in the Norwegian Parliament and ex explain to you uh, the admiration to your democratic evolution since the 19th century that I has been studying with admiration, and also uh, the way, the civilized way in which you resisted the occupation by foreign power during the Second World War. And how I will speak today, uh, with a few minutes that I have, only on the, some legal dimensions of the, the actual situation. <clears throat> Arash people has a strong legal uh, resource in his hands. He received uh, the status of protected persons under the Fourth Geneva Convention in 2003, after the Security Council approved the Resolution 1511, 
that mandated the occupation forces uh, to take uh, the several initiatives in Iraq. So when the occupying forces deliver this status to the Iraq to the Iranian uh, disarmed peep residents in Ashraf, they got this status under a mandate of the Security Council under Chapter 7 of the United, uh, the United Nations Charter. That is the real legitimacy of their status as protected persons. It's not only the United States forces that deliver that, but they were acting on behalf of the Security Council. Um, but as you know, law uh, needs might, force, power, finally, to be enforced. And as in the last year, when the occupying forces delivered the, uh, the control of Ashraf to the government of Iraq, there have been several uh, initiatives and measures to downgrading this legal status and, in fact, uh, denying the rights that the people of Ashraf has under the Geneva Convention. And then the attack came in July uh, of this year. We in Spain, we have been uh, studying the situation from two points of view, from the Geneva Convention and also from the risk of a situation that could apply under the uh, status of the uh, Geneva, Geneva Side Convention. Uh, because uh, it, there are elements, uh, information, there are facts that link this willingness to uh, to destroy the people of Ashraf as a way, as continuation of the willingness to destroy the resistance movement uh, inside Iran uh, in terms of physical and personal destruction in, 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 in the, of destroying a group in its entirety or in part. And uh, I there are elements that uh, show that uh, over Ashraf looms some kind of genocide risk, real genocide risk. Then uh, we collected the facts that were known. We analyzed that from the point of view of the Geneva Convention and the Genocide Convention. Uh, we remember the card, the, the International Court of Justice, the World Court, in the last uh, uh, this, decisions concerning the interpretation and the application of the uh, genocide, uh, genocide Convention, the Convention Against Genocide, that every people, every institution, every government, every person in the world has their, uh, the, the obligation to prevent the genocide. Because the, uh, the, the, genocide, the Convention has two sides, the punishment of the crime and the prevention. And the court, well, court says the prevention is an obligation to everyone, an obligation, a government, we say in Latin, independently of the result. The result is not in your hands, but the, 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 act, the action to prevent is in your hands, even if finally uh, the outcome is not so successful that you are looking for. But this is an obligation. Then I went to the court uh, with those arguments, with those facts, and last uh, week the judge accepted uh, its jurisdiction under the Geneva Convention, and that is important. It's implicit very interesting because the internal Spanish law concerning universal jurisdiction says that a Spanish court has only jurisdiction if three conditions are uh, uh, present. The defendant is in Spain, or there are Spaniards involved in the crime, or there, are, there is a special link between Spain and the country where the facts are committed. In neither of the three conditions are present in this case. No. Uh, but the judge decided that when the, given that the Article 146 of the Geneva Con Convention obliged the member parties to declare each jurisdiction to prosecute a grave infraction to the Convention, then he got the jurisdiction directly from the Convention and declared the competence of his tribunal to investigate the crime committed in Ashraf. In two words, the international treaty overrides the internal conditions for exercising universal jurisdiction. That is a very important uh, decision that certainly uh, will uh, face uh, 
controversy will face resistance if I can say internationally because if every country uh, took this obligation in the convention in the same way, in the same terms we can be sure that the law will be more effectively applied and respected in the world so I think that the president in the Spanish court uh, should be back uh, I, I, I would like also to add that this court uh, showed its independence taking this decision against the opinion of the public prosecutor that say no you don't have jurisdiction and the court said yes because there is here the, the convention of, uh, of Geneva that gives me this jurisdiction um, but as you know very well uh, law needs being back uh, sometimes by force to be respected I realize that you have said that that in many parliaments, particularly in this one, uh, are backing the rights of the people of Arsaf in front of the danger, real danger that they are facing. There are already hundreds of victims. Uh, we have now an independent branch of uh, judicial branch of the state that accepts to take the case and has sent a regulatory letter to Iraq saying tell me if there is a court in Iraq that is effectively investigating the facts. Because if that is the case, and we all wish that the Iraqi courts effectively investigate the, the facts and uh, 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 punish the responsible for the massacre, uh, then the investigation will go ahead in Iraq. But if that is not the case, if there is no effective investigation, then the Spanish court will activate uh, uh, that is what we ask from the court. The fact uh, 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 finding commission of the Geneva Convention uh, to send an international delegation to establish the facts and then uh, to uh, uh, eventually uh, take the uh, initiative for prosecuting, uh, sending orders of arrest, international orders of arrest, etc., against the perpetrators. So we have parliamentary help, understanding help. We have already. A, a judiciary institution, maybe other courts will also investigate other dimensions of the repression in Iran. Um, but what we don't have yet is an executive branch of government that takes similar decisions. And that will be certainly a big contribution because we are talking about international law, the United Nations, but as you very, very well know, uh, it's the national state, is the state who is the engine of the United Nations. So uh, if the uh, Norway uh, state can take this initiative and create uh, uh, this uh, precedent in terms of the relations with Iraq and with Iran, I think that it would be a very helpful and major contribution. And uh, I will not be surprised that this initiative could be taken in Norway, given your personality, not only in history, as I mentioned at the beginning of my intervention, but also in, uh, I, I should say, uh, in your um, standing in face of uh, the uh, possibility of uh, becoming part of the uh, uh, European Union. I have been following very closely from Spain how the people of Norway exercise his right to say no, we have all the choices, we have all the possibilities. And uh, I want to uh, give you my, uh, my uh, um, admiration for this vote and for the respect of your government to the outcome of the vote. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I will now ask my very good friend, Jens Christian Lund, Member of the Parliament of Denmark, to give a short comment. Madam President, dear colleagues, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, I am a little unhappy to stand here after three so marvelous speeches, because first of all, my English is awful. Sadly, I cannot speak as well as the other three persons who had made the speech. But I will say something to you. As you know, or some of you know, I have been a soldier for 42 years. 
and by mistake I was elected to the Danish Parliament. <laughs> and after coming to the Parliament, I realized that the most important thing for me was to look at the system in Iran. As a former soldier, I cannot accept a system like the Iranian uh, system. And therefore, I would like to, pay, to make a tribute to all these people who have been killed by the system uh, and also to the people who were killed during the attack on Ashraf last July. I think it is, as a human being, it is a disaster that things can happen like this has happened. The president mentioned the killing of Nida. That was awful. But personally, I think the worst thing this will do that I'm not able to sleep is that the television pictures from the man who was slaughtered in the streets of Tehran. Is that a way we can treat people uh, as human beings? No, it is a disaster. And therefore, I hope that uh, we will uh, take care about and that this system will f fall down very soon. Let's say, what, what if I, you know, I am old and I even had to go out for a short moment because I am old. Uh, and therefore, I looking back and see what what happens few years ago or even years ago uh, one year ago no one really realized that there was so many people in Iran who is against the system we can see it on the street and I hope that many more people in Iran will join the demonstration, join the people who are saying enough is enough. One year ago our government still had the illusion that they could stop the nuclear weapon development. It is an illusion and I agree totally with the former speeches that the system are doing everything against Ashraf and so, so that we cannot think about these nuclear weapons and it, and I will be I think it will be the worst thing that has happened in my life if this regime will have nuclear weapon that will be a real disaster uh, a year ago or a little bit more than a year ago PMOY was still on the terror list it, when I started, I said to myself, it might be they are terrorists. You must examine if they are terrorists, they shall stay on the terror list. What I realized was that seven court decisions said they are not terrorists. I will work very hard to try to convince people that PMOY is taken away from the terror list, and it is. So I'm proud about this and we worked a little bit about that in uh, Denmark, the Danish parliament. Therefore I'm very happy and I hope that the United States will listen about this. Uh, Ashraf. I discuss this very often with my Minister of Foreign Affairs and he says it is a, a decision for the Iraqi people, the Iraqi government, and I am saying, no, it is for the world's people, because as the former speeches have said, if we will allow this camp to be removed and to be removed to another area where the safety is not uh, in the same condition as it is in Ashraf, it will be a disaster for the whole world. Therefore, we have to protect it, we have to strengthen it, and I am very happy what what I have heard here today. I was a commander in the military, and I know if I was going to war with someone else, I 
really do not hope that I should go to war. But if I was going to war, like we are in Afghanistan for the moment, we will protect even the wounded enemies. In our hospitals, we will take care about the people who are fighting against us, because that is what it is about in democracy. It is a disaster that in Camp Ashraf they are not allowed to have their doctors, nurses, medicine, fuel. It is against all understanding. I, I, I can, as a former colonel, cannot understand that people can react in this way. So I hope the best uh, for, for the, uh, the rights of the people in, uh, in Ashraf. And uh, I think that the people in Iraq are under very big influence by the system of Iran. And therefore, it is important for us to support the good will to support the people in Iraq, telling them they are making a mistake. I would like to congratulate Spain for the legal aspects, it is very, very good. And I would like to congratulate Norway. And therefore, I think it's very good what, what you have been doing. Uh, what, what, why are the people going against uh, Ashraf? Is it because there are ammunition and weapons hidden in Ashraf? No! Everyone knows that there are maybe not even a knife. So it is a, a disaster if we are not protecting these. I will stop my speech now because I could have said a lot of things, but I think more clever people will say, but I will say to you, Madam President, my feelings is for your people. And every time I'm thinking, for your people, I'm thinking of your daughter. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I don't know if Mrs. Rolivé wants to say something at the end or... doing its best to destroy the center of hope and aspiration for the Iranian people, that means Ashraf and its residents. And the insistence of Khamenei and Ahmadinejad to destroy Camp Ashraf is the best hallmark to see what is the alternative to this regime. Therefore, once again, I extend my hand and call upon all members of parliament in Norway. As I have from other members of parliament, I first thank the Parliamentary Committee in Britain and Denmark. I extend my appreciation to them. Also from the great achievement, the judicial achievement that he has had so far. But I think that this international solidarity against the crime is is not only in the benefits of the Iranian people, but also the benefits of the people of the region and the rest of the world. Because a religious dictatorship ruling Iran is fearful of one alternative, and that is the alternative of the National Council of Resistance in Iran, and it's the principal force the people's Mujahid in Iran, and therefore they are doing their best and using all their uh, tools to destroy this movement, so that they may regain the balance that they have lost. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
ました。